never been an artist that influenced by these big things that happen, um, big changes in life, uh, like a pandemic. Uh, I know a lot of artists are starting to make work that responds to the idea of the pandemic, and it, ten it tends to be these really broad concepts that they're they're responding to. I've always been a fan of how the single person reacts or a couple of people. That's that storyteller aspect, right? I want to I wanna know the story of the one person who's living in isolation during all of this. And if I was to create something in response to it, that's the story I'm going to tell. That's the work I'm going to create. The pandemic would be more of the cause of the effect of the character rather than being the main focus of the story. The story is a person, not the pandemic. So... Welcome back to Sustaining Craft, the podcast all about those who make some or all their income from their art or craft. I'm your host, Elizabeth Silverstein, and we're doing a special season on how creatives have been impacted by the pandemic been going on. And I have a Robert Bean. He's back. Hi, Robert. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> good. Um, explain what you do. Uh, I'm a visual artist. Uh, painting and drawing mostly is what I focus on. Uh, I consider myself to be more of a a visual storyteller. I like to create narratives within my work and I often base it on figure or the individual or people, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm also uh, an instructor. I, I teach at the university level and I teach in the Museum School of the Arkansas Art Center. Awesome. So the last time we talked was a while ago. <laughs> it was yeah. um, the fall of 2018. What have you been up to um, since we last talked? Well, uh, I've been working on a lot of projects on my own. Uh, I've got several book projects that I'm working on where I'm creating illustrated short stories, that sort of thing. Those are more long-term projects. Uh, I actually write some as well. Um, I don't know how well I write, but I, I give it a shot. Um, and I've also been uh, Work every Friday on Facebook. I started posting what I called Art Thoughts for Friday, which are these little short essays about being an artist or some of the issues we wrestle with, things that we deal with, that sort of thing. And um, I was surprised by how popular it was, and so I've kept it going. And I've started working on putting a collection of those essays together as well. I'm hoping to have that out, depending on what's going on in the world, sometime this summer. Um, my original launch date had been April, but that has all been, well, topsy-turvy is the best way to put it right now. Yeah. Um, and over the past couple of years, uh, the Arkansas Art Center is going through their big renovation project. So we've had to, um, I'm chair of the painting and drawing departments of the school, and we had to move the school to a temporary location, set up new studios, um, get all our classes going. I mean, it, it was it was monumental, let's just say that, to get everything moved over. And I had the easiest job probably in painting and drawing. It was basically like, well, move the easels and the, and the side tables and I think we're good to go. Uh, I didn't have to do like ceramics with their entire kiln room and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, but I have been incredibly busy with all of that, yeah. Awesome. So I always get excited when I hear that people are writing because that's my my primary <laughs> thing uh -huh. that I do. But I know you have a you have a background in that as well. Even though you do a lot of uh, art itself, you grew up doing like well reading comic books, and I know that's mm -hmm. influenced your art. Has that influenced how you write as well? Um, not so much actually. Uh, I the stuff I've been writing has actually been in poetic form, okay. um, which is very different from a comic book script kind of thing or a comic narrative. Um, but I, music lyrics have influenced me a lot lately, the way they structure things, the way they have kind of a, a rhythm to the, to the words, that sort of thing has heavily influenced what I'm doing. And it's influencing my visual art as well. Um, how I create repetition visually, how I, how I create a sense of rhythm in the work. Um, so I've really gotten into listening to a lot of music and trying to understand how they put all that together. How do they piece that together? 
Um, the, but the, the comic book influence is just the, the storytelling influence, that idea of I'm going to link several different things together, whether they are image panels or they are, you know, stories or whatever else. I have a hard time making anything that's just a one-off anymore. I, I can't just sit down and go, I'm going to make one painting about this one thing and be done with it. I have to make 20. That's just the way I work now. And I will find ways to tie them all together. Sometimes it might be a really cohesive narrative. Sometimes it'll be a much looser narrative or even just, I'm going to use these repeated elements and, and visually tie everything together, that sort of thing. And my writing does the same thing. I found that I do, I do the same. I don't write one poem. I'm writing five that all link together to tell a bigger narrative. Right. Yeah. And that's, um, I do, I, this is like, that brings out the nerdiness in me, but um, when I tell people I'm a writer, they're, they're like, oh, so you write books, right? You're an author. And it's like, oh, no. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I dabble in that, but there's so many different ways to write. And there is this, um, there's something, two things that are, two separate things that are happening in your brain too, is when you can do a short form, like a one shot, boom, it's done. And then when mm -hmm. you build an overall narrative, and it sounds right. like your brain is wired. Like I need to, to tell this overarching story and bring it from yeah. to development to completion. Yeah, very yeah. much. Sometimes it'll, it'll start with a little kind of pop that look like mm -hmm. I might put together four or five stanzas and go, okay, I like this. And it might sit that way for six months and then go, okay, now I see how to create another 200 stanzas in five different, different poems and put all that together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's how my brain works. It's really just, oh, okay, that's done. Yeah. yeah. And I do really love the richness of it. Not that, you know, the one one offs aren't rich or, or powerful mm -hmm. in their own right, but there is really something beautiful I found personally to be able to to create this this bridge and this journey to kind of draw people through. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I well, agree with that. Yeah, it's just a lot of yeah. fun. And this, that, that bonus element too that you can do the visual as well. So you can actually mm -hmm. create two elements all together. Yeah. That's really cool. Oh, I just love art so much. <laughs> um, well, let's touch on two before I, I've got a few more questions uh, for okay. you. And I'm gonna, I'm linking everything to the previous podcast that I did, the previous article I wrote on you. So people wanna mm -hmm. kind of hear your origin story. We've covered all of that. But I do have, I've really enjoyed your uh, Friday essay. So um, tell me a little bit about how those started and why you wanted to get those thoughts out there. Okay. Um, I started those last summer and it was, I was looking for a different way to engage with people. Um, and, and part of the reason for that was that the work I was doing, especially last summer, that was when we were really moving the museum school. I was really involved with that. Um, and it was taking, it was taking some of my time to do that. And I, and the work that I was producing visually wasn't the kind of work I could just share at the time I was working on those book projects. So I might have a short story that needed, um, 12 illustrations. Well, I have to take the time to produce all 12 of those. And they're not something that I'm probably going to share a lot because I don't want to put it all out there right now. It's not done. It's not finished. Um, and so for me to be able to stay engaged with people, I was trying to find another way to do it. And I thought, why don't I just start writing something, um, talking about what it is that I do, that sort of thing. And so they really were short when I started them, they might be two paragraphs and they were more of a prompt than they were an essay. And I would say, you know, deal with something like, well, I have a hard time, you know, letting go of work or something like that. How about you guys? What do you do? You know, and I would kind of end it with a question and then people would kind of respond and it was more of a dialogue. But then as it evolved, I started to see the form and I started saying, these are real essays. Some of the stuff that I want to write about is a real essay. Um, in fact, I think the one that, that really kind of pushed me forward was I wrote one about alcohol and how prevalent it is in the arts and and how maybe it's not a great thing that every single art event is inundated with alcohol and and, and most almost all of them are and and that was that was a kind of a heartfelt essay um i it was the longest one i'd written at that point and that was where it kind of turned the corner for me and i said okay these are real essays i'm starting to write these are real in-depth thoughts and at that point i had enough people that were 
kind of cheering me on and, and sending me messages and saying, I really love this. I look forward to every Friday. But I thought, man, I've stumbled into something here. I need to keep doing this. Sometimes that, it feels good to get it off my chest too. Yeah. Just, you know, get it out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was one of the big things when I first met you and Diane Harper, who was also on the podcast previously, the way you both combine the artistic side, the business and the thoughtfulness of it has always just been super interesting to me. So to have that down on paper and to be able to consume it that way has been fascinating because I know one of the biggest things I'll, I'll, I keep thinking about is when the three of us had lunch and I think Jim was there too. Um, when mm -hmm. you talked about how you don't give away free art and and why and mm -hmm. how it impacts things and that was something I never even thought about or considered or or I it just it's just so prevalent for people to reach out to artists and be like hey give us some free stuff for this fundraiser because right a fundraiser mm -hmm. is a good thing it's an important yeah. thing for helping people and then um, just how you, how you how you explained it and those are some of the things that you touch on with your essay. So if you, you don't mind, would you mind sharing why you won't give away free art and how that impacts you as an artist? Um, because the, the, the works that we create, one, um, I don't think the tax laws have changed yet. If, if someone donates a, an item, um, they get often they get to write off whatever the value of the item is. But when it comes to art, you get to write off um, as a as a tax write off. And I don't even know if this even exists anymore. I haven't looked in, in about a year, but the way it used to be is you got to write off material cost. So if I created a painting that that I would sell for two thousand dollars retail, but it cost me a hundred dollars in materials to make it, my write off for donating the painting was a hundred dollars, not two thousand. And that's a really big problem when that $2,000 means a lot for the artist to be able to sell it. Um, if it costs me $100 to make a painting and I can sell one for $2,000, that gives me the resources to make 20 more paintings. Right. So why would I want to give that up like that? Now, some, some charities have done a good job in understanding this and they've started to work with artists where they do stuff like um, they give 50% of the sale to the artist or that sort of thing. But if they put it on like a, like a silent auction or something, they often lowball the beginning bid. And then if the artist doesn't, if it doesn't get up to what it should be, some minimum where they don't watch that, and also the artist is selling work for way under market value. So there's a lot of different problems in all of that. Um, but I would rather donate my skills or my time than the pieces I create. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, you know, there are other things that artists can do or get, you know, volunteer my time, just go in and help the organization, do stuff like that. I don't have to give my artwork up for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And those are some of the things that you touch on in your essays every Friday, too, mm -hmm. of the impact and the delta and going into the depth of it, which I think are, are such valuable conversations to have, things that people don't even think about because the things that are getting us through this pandemic are the things that people devalue in any other setting, which is the arts. I know. <laughs> I've really enjoyed watching as everyone has all of a sudden they're starting to draw or try to play music and they're, they're getting back into all this stuff. And, you know, I've seen the, the stuff flying around that says you don't support the arts. Well, what are you doing right now? You're watching movies, reading books, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're coloring, you're doing all these things. Those are the arts. Yeah. And I'm 100% behind that. We should be funding and supporting the arts, not, not letting them go or devaluing them. Yeah, and when the systems crumble, which they have, it's the creativity that's getting everybody through it. So, all right, this doesn't work mm -hmm. right now. How do we rethink it? How do we try something different that's art, that's creative, that's artistic? It's. Uh, I uh, I posted an example on Facebook that was I'm trying to remember the band name. They're out of I think Oakland, where they were supposed to shoot their music video and then got the the stay at home order came down and so. They got creative and they actually use Zoom. And it's an amazing video to watch. And they took basically what is a, a business networking software and made this really creative thing out of it. And to me that, and they did it in a week, you know, or mm -hmm. two or whatever it was. To me, that's the, that's the power of the arts and the creative brain. Yes. Okay, we get hit with the setback. Well, what can we do instead? And mm -hmm. it doesn't just grind to a halt for artists. They just kind of go, okay, let me roll up my sleeves and I'll figure out a different way to do this. Yep. Um, and they get in there and do it. And I think that would benefit everyone 
so much more if we would fund and teach that kind of thing to everybody, not just. Mm -hmm. Yep, because when the, the systems crumble, yeah. people don't know what to do. It's the creatives that are going like, no, I, let's try it this way. Let's see what happens. Right. So important. Exactly. And that's, um, so I became a, a dog trainer in 2017, and I'm still mm -hmm. a writer. I'm still creative, but my writing has been such a, a powerful tool in my dog training work, and it's something that will never go away, and that's something I've been thinking a lot about, too, is how everyone should be able to write well. I should be able to consume you know your work as an artist and someone else who's a really good writer I have a nurse who just headed to New York City and she's writing about her experiences and she's doing such a good job everyone should be able to at least try something like that because that's where um, that's where the innovation happens that's where the really beautiful things happen so absolutely it's, yeah it's cool it's cool to watch yeah. <laughs> um, well share a little bit too about how how everything has impacted all of your work and how, how you've been able to pivot yourself and, and what you've been able to do. You know, in, in a weird way, it hasn't affected me, I think, nearly as much as it has some others. Um, before I started um, teaching and, and being a department chair at the, at the museum school, I was actually self-employed for a long time. I worked on my own. I had to get up every day, set my own schedule. I would get into the studio. I tried to keep hours as best I could in the studio. I did graphic design from home, all that. And even over the past couple of, I guess, year and a half or whatever, I get up about 6.30 in the morning and I get in the studio. I make a cup of coffee and I go in the studio and I work for about four or five hours if I can. And I do that almost every day. Sometimes I take a Saturday or a Sunday off, but I usually will do at least one of the two in the studio as well. So when all of this hit and all of a sudden we were having to stay home and I'm having to, you know, work from home for the art center and, and, and my class at UALR went online and all it did was mean, okay, when it gets to, you know, after I have lunch, 12, 1230, I'm just clocking in and working remotely. It didn't change my flow in terms of what I was doing in the studio. I was still getting up at 6.30, just like I had been already, and going to the studio. I've been cranking work out. Just, you know, I guess the only thing is it's actually made my life a little bit easier because I don't have to commute. I'm not having to, like, you know, you know, get dressed and get in the car and, and head out. I can stay in studio clothes all day long and just keep working. And my studio is set up in such a way that I have kind of two segments to it. I've got a, a segment where I have the easel and, and um, places to make larger work. And then I have a, a segment of it that has my drafting table and my computer where I can do smaller work or I can do writing or I can do things like teach and stuff like that. And so it's just a matter of, I kind of move from one side of the room to the other and keep going. Um, and, and I don't, I've never been an artist that influenced by these big things that happen. Um, big changes in life, uh, like a pandemic. Uh, I know a lot of artists are starting to make work that responds to the idea of the pandemic, and it, ten it tends to be these really broad concepts that they're, they're responding to. I've always been a fan of how the single person reacts, or a couple of people. That's that storyteller aspect, right? I wanna, I wanna know the story of the one person who's living in isolation during all of this. And if I was to create something in response to it, that's the story I'm going to tell. That's the work I'm going to create. The pandemic would be more of the cause of the effect of the character rather than being the main focus of the story. The story is a person, not the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that's why I haven't really changed what I'm doing in terms of that. I'm still doing figure drawing. I'm just doing it from videos online. I'm still making, you know, these illustrated stories that I've been working on. I'm still writing poems and those poems and those stories tend to be about people. Um, and, and I'm trying to investigate people that are not like me. And I, to me, this is always one of the, the big advantages I always found in writing versus visual arts. And visual arts is this weird thing about like, we expect artists to have this like inner truth or this kind of ability to be a seer. They can see these things about the world and express them and all that. And I'm not sure where that came from. I think it's why illustrators often get put at the kids' table when you're talking about the arts in general, right? Because they're trying to interpret someone else's ideas or their own writing or something like that. And illustrations don't always get held up to the same standard as what we call fine art. Well, writing, I can investigate what it 
it's like to be someone I'm not. I could try to write a character that's maybe a 50 year old Asian woman that lives on, you know, the West coast or something like that and try to write that character. I better get it right. But you know, it, I can try that. Now, if I tried to do that in the visual arts, I think it's much harder to pull something like that off. So for me, it's fun to sit down and write a story. I have a, one of the stories that I'm working on is actually um, a young woman who, whose boyfriend dies and the entire illustrated story is her having a monologue at his gravestone. Mm. And that's been a, a really amazing experience for me to try to investigate and write and try to put myself in her shoes because the idea there is just loss. How do you deal with loss? And, but I want to tell it through the ideas of someone that's not me. Um, if I tried to do that visually, I think I'd have a harder time. Actually, I know I would cause I've tried that visually and it is much harder to do. So, when it comes to big things like a pandemic, I would rather sit down and write a story about one person dealing with it. You know, maybe dealing with the loss of it, they lose someone in it, or feeling the fear that comes from being isolated by it. Uh, those sorts of things, rather than talking about, you know, just the pandemic in general, if that makes sense. It does, and I think that's a really good point too in how you're broadening your world by trying to explore someone who's not like you. I think a yeah. lot of writers do a disservice and people are, they're told that something that I think does a disservice where like, well, write what you know, write who you are. It's like, well, yeah. I stay stuck if I'm just gonna stay in, in who I am, but if I wanna understand the world, I not only have to consume a lot of different people who aren't like me, but I also need to explore those different types of, of viewpoints that aren't like me. That's how I grow and that's how I advance as an artist, not just by Absolutely. Um, writing my own experiences. Yeah. I, I you know, I had um I had a fantastic creative writing instructor, uh, David Giles. He's a fantastic writer, a brilliant teacher. And he said something in class one day that has stuck with me and has influenced me from that moment on. And he, he started with that idea of what you talked about, that, that write what you know. And he said, start with what you know, but make the rest up from there. And that, that stuck with me. It has always stuck with me. And that is how I do it. It might be something I understand, like the loss of someone. Start with what I know, what it feels like to lose someone. But now let's explore that from someone that I'm not. Let's make the rest up from there and see what it, how someone else might react to that very same thing that I've experienced and gone through. Yeah. Well, and the other, yeah, the other thing I wanted to add that too is when you, when you start with what you know, you understand what feels genuine and what doesn't. So when you're not mm -hmm. hitting the mark and you realize you have to go further, you can feel that as an artist. And if you, Absolutely. Can't, if you can't feel it yet, that just means you have more work to do. Like if it's not hitting you one way or another, you just have to go deeper. So it's just, you know. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> That's so great. Well, Robert, how can people find you um, if they want to consume, you know, your, your essays or some of your work? The, the essays I'm posting right now on my personal Facebook page and I make them public. So I, I'm guessing people, if they, if they found me on Facebook, they could see them and read them. Um, but I'm also, trying to find the right um, vehicle to start doing more polished versions and post them regularly. I'm looking at places like Medium, some stuff like that where I can post an essay. My issue is Medium has a paywall essentially, right? Yeah. And so you only get like, I think three free articles a month or something like that. And I'd really rather find some kind of service like that where I can put them out there and it's not just me doing it on my website alone, but where I can kind of tap into a greater pool of readers essentially. So I'm working on that for, for now. And like I said, I'm putting a book out sometime this summer. Um, it, it, the best place to see a lot of what I'm doing with my visual art is actually my Instagram account, which is just um, RB Fine Art. So if, if you look up RB Fine Art on Instagram, you'll find me. Um, and it'll have uh, a link to, like I'll often post about some of the stuff I'm doing and and have links to, you know, find other connections to what I'm doing. Uh, basically, if you look up RB Fine Art on like Facebook, if you look it up on Instagram, if you look it up on Twitter, I, that's what I use for all my, my handles on those. So you can find me in that way. Perfect. And I'll link in descri description boxes and in the article, all that too. And how can people support you at the moment? Um, you can always buy my work and that's always really nice when that happens. 
Um, but other than that, I also, like I said, I teach, you know, uh, and we're, we actually just, um, we're going to start some classes next week that are online classes at the museum school that are incredibly affordable. I'm teaching a four week class on drawing the head, the face and the hands, which are often really difficult parts of drawing the figure. And it's $20 for the four week class. It'll meet. Whoa. Yeah. 20 bucks. <laughs> It'll meet twice a week through zoom. We'll do kind of a video demo kind of thing. And I'll have like a Google classroom or something someplace where everyone can post their work and post ideas and talks and stuff like that. Um, I'm teaching a class on composition. So if they go to the Arkansas art center.org and look under museum school, you can find those classes and register for them. Um, I don't know when you're posting this video, but they do start like Monday. So I don't know. If, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if this would, if it would be too late to register for this round of them, but um, I'm always teaching going? class. It, uh, we're rolling them out to test them and we're okay. going to see how this, this round of classes go for four weeks. And then, you know, and then we also are going to reassess. We're supposed to have a summer term, but we don't know if we're still all going to be stuck at home in June or if we're going to be allowed to go back and teach classes. Uh, that's all real up in the air. We're having to just take that week by week right now. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, take classes from me, you know, support my work. Uh, I have a, I've, signed up for a patreon but i haven't set it up yet because i don't have the time to make all the rewards and all that kind of stuff so at some point i'll do that but um but yeah for right now it's basically just you know buy me work when my book comes out buy that and you know that kind of stuff will will help support me absolutely yeah those are great options i'm excited about about that yeah this will come out next week so it might might miss you know people signing up but hopefully it does really well and we can do another do another round yeah that's that's a steal. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, well, Robert, was there anything else you wanted to add? That was all of my questions. I, I just appreciate the fact that you're out here doing this, that you're talking to us and putting, you know, giving us a chance to, to have a dialogue and putting it out there for other people to watch. I love, you know, listening to artist interviews and, and hearing what they have to say and stuff like that. I learn a lot from it. So thank you for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for participating and for trusting me with uh, sharing your story. This has been Sustaining Craft with your host, Elizabeth Silverstein. Music has been provided by Jim Chiago of 7 Second Chance. Find him on iTunes and Spotify. And big thanks to Robert Bean, my special guest today. And Robert, before we sign off completely, what do you hope for on the other side of all of, all of this, everything that's happening right now? I'm hoping that people uh, don't lose that creative aspect that they found during all that when when they're back out to their normal lives they're still trying to make things and they understand the value of creative pursuits 